It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. What a week it has been. The Supreme Court wanting to repeal the 20th century. Uh, Roads buckling from the heat. The select committee on January 6th, the fun around that. So, so much wing nut week in review to get to and here to share some thoughts on the week that was. I've asked our all-star panel to come talk with us. Uh, Chris Hahn, syndicated radio host, host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast. Chris, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me, Rick. Also, Scott Dworkin, co-founder of the Democratic Coalition. Scott, thanks for being here. What's up, Rick? And, of course, my favorite reporter on the whole planet, Sarah Burris, reporter over at Raw Story. Sarah, thanks for being here. I am always happy. So let's fire up with the the big story of the Supreme Court. Another moment where uh, our, our six to three conservative court or corporatist court uh, is has done a, another job of repealing the 20th century. Uh, Scott, let's let's go to you with the the decision to you know basically uphold uh, Arizona's law and do away with what was left of the 1965 Voters' Rights Act. Yeah, I mean it just gives Congress more, uh, I, I guess, oomph on their willingness to move, and they they're going to have to react to it in some sort of way because it's. It's utterly ridiculous. Um, they're basically validating uh, this voter suppression and these these laws that are pretty racist across the country. And uh, it's very disappointing, but it's not surprising. Uh, it's also another, uh, I guess, excuse for us to approach expanding the bench, because I don't think that the Supreme Court is representative, obviously, of America. And it has to be. And as of right now, you just have a uh, Basically, it's a it's a Trump controlled Supreme Court uh, until that changes. You know, we're going to have these same kind of decisions reaching for the next few years and whatnot. So we're going to need some some kind of catalyst that brings this to change. Uh, the one thing that I think will backfire on this is they're making these restrictive voting laws. But at the same time, they're saying that voting and elections are a fraud. So it's going to be really tough to turn out those voters. Democratic voters, on the other hand, are going to go through the motions and look through all the ideas as to, or sorry, all the rules as to what qualifies them to vote, how are they going to be able to vote uh, to ensure that they do. Republicans, on the other hand, they're going to try and rush them out last minute. And at that point, those laws will affect them negatively because they won't be able to register to vote. They won't be able to vote in the right precinct or whatnot. There won't be much latitude there. So I think this is all going to backfire in the long run. Um, they also for, face the DOJ lawsuit right now in Georgia, and that'll spread to other states as well. So I think it's just part of our longer fight. We expected it, but we didn't expect it to be this bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it, and I, w- I was kind of surprised in reading uh, you know, some of the stuff that came out from the decision, basically going, yeah, okay, we know that it's discriminatory, but that's okay. It's okay to right. have unequal outcomes. Uh, let's go to the aggressive progressive. Uh, Chris, what, what were your thoughts? You know, it, totally expected, right? They are completely in the pocket of the right wing. They have made the Supreme Court a joke. I, I'm a lawyer, as you may or may not know, uh, you know, had a lot of respect for the Supreme Court uh, going through law school, reading these opinions of these people on both sides of the aisle, making decisions in the best interest of this country over the last two centuries. And to see what they've done to voting rights in the last 10 years, it, it just makes me and everybody else who study the law and believes in law and order and justice and the access to the ballot makes us sad, but it also makes us angry. And frankly, you know, I I agree with what Scott said. I think it is a catalyst to make Democrats move on voting reforms in the Senate and in the House. I don't think that Joe Manchin wants his career's epitaph to be, he's the guy that oversaw the undoing of the American democratic experiment, experiment. I think he wants to find a way to get in there and actually make this happen. He's floated the idea of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Stacey Abrams has endorsed that. Uh, I think you're going to see some changes to the filibuster. And I, I think that there'll be people that will go along with it, that you will be that will be unexpected to you so that we can see people vote in this country free and clear of it. And like Scott said, Democrats are going to come out and vote and Republicans are going to be turned off by this voting's a fraud thing. But here's the thing. I can organize around, uh, you know, where people vote, what ID they need to have, 
what other restrictions it is for register, et cetera, the days, the times. I can't organize around, I can change the outcome if I don't like it. And the question I have for the Supreme Court is when that gets to them, and it will, uh, where will they stand on that? You know, it's one thing to say a state can say, I'm going to choose the time and place and manner for people to vote. It's another thing for a state to say, I'm going to allow a partisan legislature choose the winner of an election. That is not American. That is not democracy. And that cannot stand. And if this court or any other court, for that matter, upholds those types of laws, you're going to see people in the streets like you've never seen before. And quite frankly, I'm not one to march, but I'm going to march for that. No, I mean, I see as where I am. I think all of this comes back to, uh, you know, we haven't done enough marching. We haven't done enough, uh, you know, rattling the, the cages, so to speak. Uh, and they feel they can get away with this stuff. Sarah, wanted to get your initial thoughts on it. Yeah, it is long past time to take to the streets. Very long past time. Um, for folks who don't know what the Supreme Court said, the Arizona law, uh, the, the super restrictive um voter uh voting laws there they said that it doesn't violate uh article two in the voting rights act which says that you can't specifically target people based on race or gender or all of those things but what the arizona law and i would argue um the georgia law as well um what that does is it really just targets democrats which i guess isn't in the voting rights act so there you go like they're just like okay well we're just going to go after the Democrats because that's not in there. You, you know, people of color, we're not going to talk about you guys, but um, we'll just, we're just going to kill the Democrats here. And so that's sort of what I feel like um, they've, they've sort of weaseled their way into. Um, Chris was talking about the, the Supreme court. Every time a decision comes out, I just imagine Brett Kavanaugh uh, just throwing back beers being like, I got an opinion for you, you know? <laughs> Um, and so I, there's, it, it makes me sad because I too, uh, held them in such high esteem and now they're just kind of schmucky. They're, it's very sad. No, I mean, and, and what, what's bothering me and Chris, you, maybe you can speak to this. I mean, we're seeing decisions coming out of this court that basically is repealing the 20th century. I mean, you go back to the Janus decision, which is something that I think was a, was a horrible decision, uh, basically undoing, you know, a good portion of what built the most prosperous working class in the history of civilization. All of the advancements that we had, the progress that we had of the 20th century, it seems this court wants to roll back. We're going to bring back the Alabama voting test. We're going to bring back the days of lock. We're going to bring back yeah. all of the all of the bad old days, you know, and and it seems like like from where I'm sitting, there's almost nothing that we can do to stop them from doing it other than vote and get out in the streets. That is the only thing we can do. The only thing we can do is win elections. Right. And the problem that Democrats have had over the years been one of my big frustrations is that we come out for the presidential year and we sit out the midterms. And more importantly, we sit out local elections uh, in the midterm midterms. It, you know, we have to be on guard all the time. The Republicans have been building up benches. They've been electing people to school boards and dog catcher and mayors and city councils. And Democrats just wait for the presidential year and show up sometimes if they like the guy, if the person, you know, uh, makes them fall in love. Dem- Democrats, they have to fall in love. Republicans have to fall in line. This is a battle. And it is a battle that the Republicans came with a gun and Democrats came with like a, a flashlight to try to look who is there we need to make sure that we are fighting every step of the way for every seat ever that is on the ballot. We've got to come out. We've got to organize and we've got to be ready because, look, courts have made bad decisions in the past in this country. There's lots of them. We could go we could go through the history of this country. There's 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 dozens of infamous decisions by the Supreme Court that were overturned by the voters through Congress, through through uh, constitutional amendments and through new court members being appointed because Democrats or other progressives, when Republicans were progressive, kept winning elections and putting new people on the court. We need to have a court that understands that the right to vote doesn't necessarily mean you're just allowed to vote. The right to vote means that working people who have to work during the day have an ability to vote when it's convenient for them, that they can vote and it shouldn't have to take eight hours to vote. I think we need a law in this country that says it's got to be faster than getting dominoes, right? 30 minutes or less to, to cast your ballot. This should not take all day. I live in New York State. Uh, I have never waited more than 15 minutes to vote. I, you know, I, I, I see these lines and I just wonder, I, I'm, I'm amazed 
at the organization to get people to wait in those lines. I won't wait in line for anything. I won't wait in line for ice cream, and I love ice cream. So I'm amazed at the organization that has gone into it. But I'm telling you, when you tell a group of people that they can't vote, that makes them vote more, makes them more likely to vote, makes them enthusiastic about voting and makes them get other people to vote with them. I hope you're right, Sarah. I, you know, I look at this and I'm, on his point, I've never waited more than 15 minutes, uh, but that's because I'm in a predominantly red area. I'm in a 65, 35 Republican, you know, insane, crazy old, uh, but I've never waited longer than 15 minutes. And like him, I can't imagine standing in line for eight hours uh, to vote. When, uh, whenever I was in college, um, 2004, we ended up having to stand in line for probably, I want to say maybe two hours. Um, they, uh, they had cut a bunch of the, uh, the polling places for on campus people or near campus people. Um, but, you know, Northwest Oklahoma City, I've never had to wait, you know, long at all. Um, I just started voting by mail though. Uh, because first of all, you know, like I don't, one, I don't want to stand in line, but, but secondly, um, why, why not, why not just throw it in there and be like, and be done with it early on. Cause we don't want people um, voting, then, Sarah. We don't want people voting. Uh, what was that pay, that Paul Wayward quote? We don't want everyone to vote. You know, our leverage goes up as the voting populace goes down. Right. Yeah. And that's how Republicans operate. Uh, you know, the more people that vote, the more Democrats win. And the fewer people that vote, the more Republicans win. And they made it very clear. Like, they have said the quiet they, part out loud. They can't compete. That. They can't compete with ideas. No. They don't have any They don't have any ideas. Even the people who support them don't like their ideas. They like our ideas until we tell them who came up with the idea. Right. Right? They don't have – Republicans don't have ideas anymore. They, they have slogans and they have racism and they have – Fear that person who's going to take your job, even though, you know, look, if everybody was into capitalism, like Republicans say they were, people would compete for their job. They would work harder. They would change their profession. They would they would educate themselves to change with the times. We wouldn't have to be so protectionist in the way we do things in this country. But they don't have ideas to get people to vote. So the only way they maintain maintain their minority rule in this country is by changing the election map. And by making it harder for people to vote in states like Georgia and Texas, where they are losing now, they are they've been losing ground every year. They're about to lose Texas. Trust me, that scares them to death. That's why all these governors around the country are buying into this Texas, you know, border fiasco that Greg Abbott's trying to utilize to distract Texans from his mm -hmm. failure to lead Texas through crises, whether it be the winter where, you know, they got two inches of snow and and hundreds of people died and didn't have power or now oh it's hot in the summer the grid wasn't prepared for cold in the in the, in the winter or hot in the summer way to go texas government way to go 30 years of republican only rule you want to know why they got people at the border right now they don't want you thinking about the fact that your air conditioner is broken and that texas can go blue and once texas goes blue it's all over in this country well, that, that is kind of the hope, right? The hope is, is uh, you know, Texas does wake up and, and we move this country in a different direction. Scott, I want you to jump in on this because, you know, uh, he makes an interesting point. Republicans haven't had any ideas for a very long time. And the ideas that they did have were bad and got us into the mess that we're in. But they do know how to scare people. They do know how to throw out a boogeyman. They do know how to scare, make people afraid of, of things that they don't even understand. Right, Mr. Potato Head, and things like that. The the uh, I think one of the things that happened with the Democrats uh, since they became in leadership now, and it's completely changed the dynamic with everything. One of the things I've been doing is I've been talking more behind the scenes and not vocally uh, as much about criticizing Democrats or what we need to do or talking leadership as much publicly. Uh, and I think that's starting to spill over now because we gave them the opportunity to lead and some have not. Uh, and I think that we're going to hold them accountable, the ones that have not, um, the ones that. Uh, so so there, I, I think we've been getting vaccinated. We had the attack on the Capitol to deal with. We impeached the former president again. We had Biden-Harris administration come in and that took a while to to get in here. Um, and so we, we just kind of demasked. We just are getting back into a society point of uh some sort of civility with at least half of the country. Um, so, you know, we had that opportunity to lead. I think the, uh, what, what Chris is talking about, about us 
going to the streets and whatnot, I think that time is coming. I'm not sure exactly what's going to be the first thing to spark it, but I think people are back to a comfortable feel about that. And, and everyone seems to be antsy, but also that means that we have energy returning to us because I, I, I don't know about anybody else, but after five years of every single day, 18 to 20 hour work days, a constant barrage of all this nonsense and propaganda, mm. I had to sit there and, uh, decompress for a second and and figure out you know how do we move from this position of us you know being outraged at a constant and come up with the ideas of like okay how do we implement how do we turn this into law how do we move the needle on this or that um and, and it just was so complex and we had no time to plan before this so you know we had remember we also had the georgia elections we had to fight on January 6th for people to stop overturning elections. We had to get gotcha videos of senators across the country. Um, We were tracking them down. I mean, it's, it really is. I think we get, we don't give ourselves enough credit for how much work that we've done and how much we've done to save this country as of right now. And, and I think that it will, we've got the momentum or momentum. People hate that word, Uh but we've got, we've got the momentum to, to use here. Uh, I, I think after the fourth, something will happen that brings everybody, at least normal Americans together um, to push for all of this nonsense to just uh, it, it'll be outrageous. Uh, and, and I think people are going to look at when the smoke settles on COVID, they're going to want somebody to blame. Um, we're going to have a grieving period. It's going to be uh, sort of along the lines, I would assume, of like 9-11 um we're, we're gonna have to deal with that at some point we're gonna have to deal with january 6th there's gonna be constant court cases you have the indictments of we'll talk about that later but um long story short democrats haven't really had that chance to lead and we haven't pushed them enough publicly to be like here's what we need to do but i'll, I'll tell you what I did have conversations with the original plans that they had in regards to investigating january 6th and I lost my mind privately. And I, I said, this needs to be a select committee period. Yep. Uh, and it should have been done on the, so on the, on the 21st, uh, the day after they possible. took power. Now should you don't give them an opportunity to play these games, just move straight into a Benghazi like yeah. select committee. Yeah. yeah. I wanted them to impeach Trump on January 6th when they came yeah. back into session. I'm like, why are we waiting? We know what happened here. We all saw it. Get a vote right now. Let's see how people feel right now yep. while they're hot, because people were hot that night. You might have even gotten Kevin McCarthy to vote to impeach Trump that That's night. True. I don't know why they didn't just come while they were hiding under a desk. They should have been drafting articles of impeachment. Right, it was right ridiculous. Got to take a quick break right here, guys. You can stick around through the break on the other side. We're going to get into uh, boy, it's, it's kind of hot outside uh, and some of the things going on around there. Quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to the Rick Smith Show. On the Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I'm sure everyone saw the pictures of the street buckling, uh, the, uh, the the cables melting. Uh, we've heard all the stories of people dying. And yet still, Congress hasn't done much to move forward on an infrastructure plan because at the end of the day, uh, this does come back to our infrastructure. When you're talking about major cities in the U.S. having rolling blackouts, and it's infuriating to me that we're still talking about infrastructure and not getting stuff done. Here to share some thoughts on, well, the state of where we are and maybe where we need to go. I've asked our all-star panel to stick around. Chris Hahn, the syndicated radio host and host of the Aggressive Progressive Podcast. Scott Dworkin, co-host of Democratic Coalition. And, of course, our great friend Sarah Burris, reporter over at Raw Story guys thanks for sticking around anytime you bet so uh we we've all seen these stories let's start with you sarah we've all seen these stories of uh you know the heat the 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 misery um yet still nothing out of congress being done which i think is a really good way for everybody to start talking about the need for infrastructure i know that um yes there is the heat problem right like we've got giant uh, fires and things are melting, but at the same time, Oklahoma has had more rain in the last week than we've had in, I want to say the last three months. 
So we're dealing with an enormous amount of overspill in our dam system. So, I mean, Oklahoma never had a, a, a lake that was in it until the Army Corps of Engineers came in and every single lake in the state of Oklahoma has been created by the Army Corps of Engineers thanks to the New Deal. So you've got um, all of these dams and all these spillways that are now finally, you know, like doing what they should be. And um, you got farmers who can't cut wheat right now because of that. Um, so thank goodness for all of these things that we have because of the New Deal. And that's why we need another one of these things. You've got cities that have, um, <laughs> because people throw away those handy white things in the toilet um, and they pour grease down the, down the sewers, you end up having these massive um, glaciers of hardened just stuff in our sewer system where they actually have to take pickaxes at them and try and break them apart. Um, and so like our sewers end up being clogged because of stupid crap, um, not literal crap, just stupid crap. Um, so there, we have lots of problems. This is not just a, um, Texas heat issue or a melting, um, roads issue. Um, this is, this is everything from water to sewers to, um, drainage to dams, everything. Um, and, and we haven't touched them for a hundred years now. So no, I think I it's time to time to do something yeah, i know in harrisburg where i'm near uh we were the sinkhole capital of the world for a while because our infrastructure under the ground is so old and broken and and deteriorated buses were being swallowed up uh garbage trucks the back end of them being swallowed swallowed up and it's again the failure repeatedly not just the here now but the last term and the term before that and before that we failed to have the vision that i think joe biden has is finally and i'm grateful for the idea that we need big chunky massive investment God, I want but to get the thing thoughts. is, I want to say too, like sure. there, every single state in the country, every city in the country has a problem. If we can just start talking about those problems to the actual senator, to the member of Congress and saying, you know, like, you should vote for this because it will fix this thing in your district. That's the stuff that really turns a, uh, a light bulb on for them. Scott, yeah. your thoughts. Uh, I lived in D.C. for years and years, and I don't know if they've ever patch the roads it's one of the worst you know i guess uh, i just just traveling around here on the roads is pretty pretty terrible um for a lot of different reasons using sand for ice and uh then putting salt on top of it because the sand doesn't work and then that makes a mesh of nonsense um but yeah i mean like what i didn't understand is how you know, Republicans didn't even grasp the basics of infrastructure and what it is nowadays. And you're talking about moving things back, right, Rick? Uh, I mean, they didn't want to include the Internet as part of our infrastructure. It, it didn't make any sense. They didn't want to right. include the power grid. They wanted to just be, you know, go to this coal and people just breaking marble over. Like, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but that's just not how the world works. And we're not a third world country. So can we not act like it? And, and so that's got to be part of it. We have, we have places in this country which has a populace that have no internet, right? And we've got to count on what? Elon Musk to do the work? Like, I, yeah. I, I don't understand what we're going to do here, but this is, it's unacceptable. And I just wish that people would be able to get on the same page at least, at least. And the one thing that I was happy about is at least he got, at least President Biden got people into a room that were of different parties to agree on something, even though it was complete uh, uh, dwarfing or sorry, making it smaller, what we needed to, to be. Yeah. Um, it, it was something, but it still is just like, what, like, what are you even fighting about? What are we going to do with the money instead? Like, right. what, what are you talking about? They're sitting there screaming about nothing. And it's just like, oh, well, they think the Internet, they just want to expand the Internet. I want to talk infrastructure. What are you talking about? Like, it, yeah. it's, it's just mind games and, and, and you're not accomplishing anything. And what's worse, Scott, is it's their constituents that don't have Internet. Right. Mm -hmm. People, Democrats live in cities. We have Internet. I don't have an internet problem. I've never had an internet problem. Ever since there's been internet, I've had internet, right? It's somebody in rural Oklahoma that's screwed up by they're not having internet infrastructure in that part of the uh, of the world. They don't even get it. You know, we talked about maybe it's going to be hot girl summer. It's hot planet summer. We've got 115 degrees in Portland, freaking Oregon. 
they don't even have the air condition in there. They've never needed it before in life. We've got to do something about the climate. We've got to improve the way people live their lives. That is infrastructure. We are running out of time. I quite frankly feel that we've passed the tipping point on climate mm -hmm. and that there might not be mm -hmm. any way back from it. And we've got to start preparing for the effects of climate mm -hmm. change instead of really trying to stop it because it might be gone. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be pursuing green energy, clean energy, et cetera. But we are, we, you know, when you, when you look at a map and it's 118 degrees in Canada, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, you know, uh, you know, we've missed the boat on this for a very long time because we've been stuck in this traditionalist thing. You know, I live on Long Island and I, you know, I used to be head of the United Way of Long Island, which is a big charity. And I used to always have this line, I used to say, people live in this kind of false paradox of what they are. Here on Long Island, in Nassau and Suffolk County, we have three and a half million people. If we were a city, we are the second large, third largest city in the United States of America. We're bigger than Chicago, uh, almost comparable to Houston. The problem is, on Long Island, we like to pretend we're a farming and fishing community, that we're a bunch of farmers and fishermen. And that we, you know, some of us take the train into the city to work and blah, blah, blah. But there's three and a half million people. We have all the problems of a city here. I want to build sewers and I want to build infrastructure to deal with the city problems. But they don't want that. Oh, you're going to Queensify uh, Suffolk County. We have that problem on a massive scale in the United States of America. We are living in a time and place that no longer exists. And we have people in the Senate who are far too freaking old to be making any decisions. It doesn't mean that they're old people can't make decisions, but old people that don't recognize reality on the, on, on the planet really need to go because they're not helping move things along. And it's not just Republicans. There are some Democrats who are mm -hmm. living in the 1960s in the United States Senate as well. We have Hi, to, Feinstein, I'm looking at you. Yeah, we have to acknowledge the reality, right? People live in cities. They've been moving the cities for years, or they've been moving the suburbs and cities for years. We've got to connect those cities through high-speed rail, not this crap that we build in this country that we call <laughs> high-speed rail. we got to have, like, Tokyo-style high-speed rail. We have to find ways. This way we get people out of the car. We could electrify these trains with some clean energy. It's going to save our, our, you know, our environment and get people around quicker and help us grow as a nation. We've got to we've got to figure it out. We we can't just keep living in in the 1950s. Uh, that's I think that was your point you were making, Scott. I was trying to. Oh yeah, no, no, that, it's, trying to echo it's about it. creating. It's a creating that that environment because I don't I don't understand exactly why people are so backwards on it. I mean, look at how cool it was, and, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this about President Biden, but how cool it was when he pulled up in that Ford, the EV yeah, 150, car, the electric, yeah, and he just speeds away. And like I was like, that man, was if, hot. If Donald just did that one time, EV cars would have been in four yeah. years ago like they are now. But the, maybe they weren't at that same spot. But, like, that's the kind of stuff that we need where it's like we can produce our own energy. Why are we buying gas from other right. countries? Why right. are we invading other countries for that gas? Why are we making deals with Russia for that gas? When we can have our own jobs and make our own energy here, it doesn't make and, any sense. And, Scott, me. here's the thing. It's not like there's millions of people working in oil and coal in the United States of America, <laughs> right, right. right? This is just another false paradox that the Republicans paint. It's us first them. Look, these liberals want you to get rid of your gasoline tank. Anybody who's ever driven an electric car said, holy crap, I love this car, right? right. It's just, this is just a lot of nonsense. People are people aren't breaking coal. Even if you have a coal mine, you need fifty people to work in it, not fifty thousand. It's a big machine that mines coal for a big big multinational corporation. This is not a lot of jobs. This is just another another wedge that the Republican Party has successfully used and that we have not properly messaged back. No, you're absolutely right. And I would go beyond that. It's it's even more than the Republican Party. It's the moneyed interest of this country who are the ones who are benefiting off yeah. this. And and they're they're always really good at dividing the working class of this country. Because it and, you know, I always say, look, I want solar jobs, I want wind jobs, I want all of that stuff to come around. They go, but what about the coal miners? Those are union coal miners. I go, yeah, they are. Uh, but we, they can do other things. We can get them to put up solar panels and windmills because they have yeah. skills. We can do that. We we have the ability. We you know have what, the technology. Rick? We just don't have the will. You know what, Rick? When the car was invented, the guys who made buggy whips had a problem with it. What are we going to do with all these buggy whips we're making? Yo, 
They're going to have cars? We're not, what are we going to do with all these stables we built for all these horses? What are we going to, you know, screw you. Time moves on. I don't care. I really, honestly, I don't care about things that are in the past. We've got to move on. At some point, we've got to just give up on these things that don't matter anymore. I don't hear me anymore. Yeah, so I, I want to get real quick because you know I want to transfer over here. to the uh, the other the guy who's in hot water, uh, Weaselberg, uh, Weiselberg, Weaselberg, uh, the Trump Organization <laughs> charged this week. I uh, want to get into that unindicted co-conspirator number one, Scott. Let me go with you because uh, it's yeah. Uh, looks looks like uh, looks like the Trump Organization in a little trouble. I can't tell you how good it feels to have someone who called me a fraud, who said that I should be in prison, who attacked me and my family for years and years and help direct those efforts to just time and time again, see them in handcuffs. Um, and it's not just that, but because of this fraud, it's leveraged to get to the uh, former president of the United States. And I like to call him that when it involves crimes, because uh, I want to remind people where he was uh, yeah. for so long. I mean, we're, we're, we're definitely, we're on a road right now. I don't think people understand the gravity of what's happened here. They would not indict Weisselberg unless it was an open and shut case where it was clear. And it is really, really hard, as Chris can probably attest, to beat a document case. Like, this is a document-based case. And so I... It's not as much about how he was feeling or what he was thinking during it. It's you're an accountant. You did this. This is illegal. And you did it for years and you kept it off the books on purpose. And, you know, not only that, I'm guessing this opens doors to the rest of everything else. And so I don't think that I think that they can play it down all they want. Um, but this is absolutely devastating to him. And I, I just don't see how he can come out from underneath it. The most important part of this all is it's the first one to indict really outside of his presidency. Yeah. And I think that people are going to pile on because where did I get a phone call from today was Georgia. And so all I've got to say is that I hear a lot of things happening right now from uh, different states that look to suing him because he... Uh, owes them money for rallies or destruction or, or a property or something that he's done along with that. Um, and, and so an old property developers that want to sue him for money. I mean, there's so much stuff coming at him on top of Eugene Carroll's lawsuit. Um, there, it's just too much discovery. It's too much money. Uh, I, I think that Republicans are going to drop him and act like they never saw him before. They never met him before, but I, I, they'll just move to another idol. So it'll be Ron I don't know, man. or somebody. I, look, yeah, I, I, hope you're right. I hope you're right, but I'm not getting my hopes up. Uh, I'm not getting my hopes up on these cases coming out of New York. I know there'll be more indictments coming down. Uh, I'm definitely not getting my hopes up on the Republican Party uh, dropping him in the next couple of years. They are no, I think it'll be. I think it's in the next six months. That's what I'm thinking. Like, man, I, think I think they're too. I think they're too stupid. I don't think they're paying attention enough to really understand that. I think they'll they'll hitch their wagons to Donald Trump for way too long, and then by the time it's you know the cutoff point where they're just like, okay, we're done. I think it'll be long past when they'll be able to save themselves. Yeah. They can't they're be that stupid. Are they that stupid? They're that stupid? Yes. Okay. They really they're are. Stupid. They really they're are. That, look, look, the case in point this week with the January 6th select committee vote. You know, two Republicans came along for the ride on that. The other 190 Republicans were also running for their lives on January 6th. But the but the former guy doesn't want them voting on the January 6th commission. He wants to say, oh, it was just tourists. So they went right with the former guy. That's the problem I have right now. Kevin McCarthy called him up and bitched him out on January 6th. And now Kevin McCarthy's like, whatever you want, boss, whatever you want, boss, I want to be Speaker of the House. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, I do this rap all the time on my radio show. Uh, you know, why are people even in Congress if they're not going to stand up for what America is? Yes. Right? Why are you even there? You need that stupid freaking pain you could buy it in the gift shop. It is ridiculous that these people will trade in their soul and trade in this nation for one more term in the House of Representatives. My wife's been running for Congress for fucking 28 days. It sucks. It's the worst. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, I didn't curse, Rick. <laughs> there was that. 
Uh, but you know, I got to be honest. You know, I watched you know Trump's lawyers go on and on, and it was one of those things that made me question the existence of God because you know why weren't they struck down by lightning with all of the all the lies and stuff that came out of their mouth? That's what that's lawyers are supposed to do. Bless their hearts. Yeah, <laughs> lawyer. Look, I never get mad at lawyers for defending somebody. That's what lawyers are there for. I'm a lawyer. Everybody has a right to a defense, no matter how guilty they are. Uh, and we, we have a system that's an adversarial system for a reason, because we used to think it was better for 100 guilty people to go free than for one innocent person to go to jail. I think we've forgotten that in this country. I don't know. Yeah. I think we just saw it this week with Bill Cosby. Yeah, oh, we did. Well, Had to go there, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I mean, it, 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 that's somebody who belongs in prison. That's somebody who should never be free. That's the, the disgrace. And, and I'm, it sucks that somebody... Uh, I guess I, I my understanding, Chris, I, I, I don't know if, or Sarah, if you know, uh, but apparently on the back end, like there was mm-hmm. a scheme to try and have a gotcha moment so they could prosecute. And that's how they prosecuted him. So it's they, like, I don't understand why they have to go that route when you have 90. Like it, it he made a deal. With, he made a deal, he made with, a deal the prosecutor. with the prosecutor. He made a deal with the prosecutor that statements he made in a prior uh, trial would not be used in the in, in any other trials, and then they use those statements in a trial. Mm-hmm. I look, he should be in jail for sure. He's a guilty man, but you can't do that. You can't be a prosecutor and 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 tell a defendant that no, don't worry, you can talk freely here. We won't use this against right. you, right. and then use it against them. As bad right. as this guy is. No, so, and it, by the way, and the guy who did that deal was one of Trump's. Uh, impeachment Impeachment attorney, the former uh, the prosecutor, I'm dropping his name from Philadelphia. Bruce Castor. So, I mean, there's a special place in hell for Bruce Castor, right? Uh, he he doesn't get another strike from me. He defended (laughs) Trump, he screwed up the Cosby prosecution. This is a guy, God. (laughs) There you go. Let's take a quick break right back after this with our all star panel, uh, Chris Hahn, uh, Scott Dworkin. And Sarah Burris. Right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Got the talk. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith. To the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So a little fun down at the border, because, you know, why not? Why not have one of the people who is at the January 6th insurrection, uh, this YouTube guy, uh, Anthony Aguero, uh, why not be there with, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, who's the other, the idiot from uh, Colorado, Lauren Boebert, uh, that Madison Cawthorn was there. They had a whole bunch of these conservatives running down to, to get a little time at the border because, hey, why not? It's not like we got any real problems going on in the country. I'm uh, here to share some thoughts on, well, the our traders going to the border and now this select committee uh, that is finally, finally after all these months, maybe going to start doing some work. Uh, that's why I've kept my all-star panel, Chris Hahn, uh, Sarah Burris, and Scott Dworkin. Guys, thanks for sticking around. Thanks for keeping yeah. us. Uh, so l- let's start with you, Chris. Uh, you, you got Bobert, you got Cawthorn, you got the whole cabal of crazy uh, down there with this YouTube guy who was at the January sixth uh, insurrection. Uh, this is this is ludicrous. This is ridiculous. But it's who these people are. You know, I grew up in the church, and my mother used to always say, "You will know them by the company they keep." Right. These people are hanging out with these terrorists who stormed the Capitol. Let's not not call them terrorists. They need to be called terrorists because that's what they were. Just like the Confederacy was a group of terrorists that came into this country or or wanted to overthrow our republic. As for their trips to the border, their little fantasy island trips, here's the problem. They cannot attack Joe Biden. They're not laying a glove on him. You know why? Because their base is a bunch of old white guys and Joe Biden's an old white guy. 
So they're having a really hard time demonizing Joe Biden. So every now and then they try to demonize Kamala Harris, but nobody cares about the vice president. That's why we had the great HBO series Veep, because nobody cares about the vice president. It's comical. So they can't lay a hand on Joe Biden. So they got to create these fake crises, whether it be the border, whether it be critical race theory. They got to find a straw man for them to burn down because they've got nothing else to talk about. They've got no issues to push. They've got no ideas. And the fact that they're hanging out at the border with a terrorist talking about danger to this country and they're hanging out with one of these guys who was a terrorist who tried to kill them on January 6th. If they would have gotten their hands on Lauren Boebert, you think they would have told her, knowing that she was different from anybody else in the Congress? They would have killed her like they killed anybody else. And they don't know. And they're going to sit there at the border with that person. They should be ashamed of themselves. And not one of them voted for the, the January 6th commission. Not one of them stepped forward and and condemned this stuff. Uh, they're, to me, they're, they're part of it. Sarah, your thoughts? Well, the vote for the select committee was at the same time that these guys were down at the border. So all of the people who, um, you know, we, you had over 100 Republicans who voted against the measure the ones who didn't even vote at all, it was because they were at the Trump worship rally. Um, and it really was like this rally. Uh, it wasn't his supporters. It was a rally of elected officials who were kissing his ring and whatever else they want to kiss and, uh, and and worshiping him, hoping that somehow, you know, his his sparkle will rub off on them. And, it was like and the wedding will... scene in Godfather 1. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's like, it, they're just... It, they're trying to raise money off of this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, however many photos they can get with themselves with Trump or if they can do like a selfie with Trump, you know, behind yeah. them. This is all about raising money for them. And um, I don't know why, because Marjorie Taylor Greene has enough money for all of them. Yeah. Um, so you would think that she'd be just writing them all a check from her account. But uh, I guess not. Guess Scott. I really, she didn't really love them that much. No, no, it's all about, it's about the cash. Uh, Scott, your thoughts? Yeah, she, uh, you know, it's a, it's an interesting PR stunt that is a waste of time, a waste of money. Um, you know, I think that the whole push to have, oh, Vice President Harris go to the border. Then when she goes to the border, they're like, oh, that's not good enough. And it's like, okay, well, like it wasn't to appease you in the first place. Like that's not why she went right. there. Um, but okay, these things are planned out. They're methodical when they're done by professionals, and it's not just something that you just swoop in and do she actually analyzed the situation and went to the root of the problem first and then made her way up or i guess back and then then down but it, it it's not that simple and you know i wish things were as simple as as republicans try and paint them to be uh, but it's not as simple as just putting up a wall that people can walk around yeah, it, it, it's it's much more complex than that or dig a hole beneath El Chapo style like it it's it really is. I think that there's there's just more to this story. And I think as people get into reality now, back into real life and real spaces, they won't have the opportunity to live in as much of this fantasy land of, oh, well, we're going to play cosplay uh, and end up hurting Capitol Police officers in a fit of white rage so that we can go to the Capitol and try and overturn our elections. It's just going to go down in history that anyone who touched it, I mean, think of, I, I don't know how to compare it to anything else except for how Nazis should be treated in society today. Yeah. That is how seditionists should be treated after this and anyone who supported it in any way financially helped organize it anybody who invited people there they should all be disavowed from our society and, and we be better to speak probably ever again we better we better disavow them from our society we better do it soon or well, they'll we're be not back. though chris all we're doing is uh we're, we're, we're slapping them on the wrist right now i mean some of the the first people to plead guilty uh little, uh, don't do it again 500 fine I, sorry you know what i'm I'm less concerned with the people who were like foot soldiers in the war than the people mm -hmm. who were leading it. No, right? I want all of them. Edging I want them all on, the way to the top. There. I want those people hung, frankly, because they, they are people. traitors. And it, it, is, it is. They're already trying to plan for for um, 
August. Like, that's the thing. We're already hearing language about them plotting for August, doing this, this stuff again, and it's the militias that are doing it. it, it it's not the, you know, probation. Well, you people. know what? If they show up in August, with a, you know, with a president who's going to take it seriously, they better be rounded up and arrested or shot dead if they need to be. You know, we hear about this Ashley Babbitt, President Trump, former President Trump wants to know who killed Ashley Babbitt. Donald Trump killed Ashley Babbitt and mm -hmm. Ashley Babbitt killed herself because she was a terrorist who was inspired by a terrorist leader, Donald Trump, who doesn't believe in American values. And I, you know, if they show up in August, uh, our National Guard better be ready and our capital better be well protected and they better be meeting a fate like any other country that's ever stood toe to toe with the United States Army. And they will. And they will, I believe. So, you know, it'll be a bad day for America, but uh, maybe it'll end this. Yeah. No, you, there's a lot of barriers. Sorry? Oh, there's a lot of barriers that are built around this. And as a person who used to be a body man for for people or elected officials, there is a red zone or a zone of like no return yeah. where they had an mm -hmm. open shot in that hallway to then go after all these members of Congress. And that almost nearly ended everything there. But behind them was a tactical team who could have also opened fired on them. It could have been really, really bad, mm -hmm. but because they were overtitled white people who were, uh, following the orders of the president, it made things really, really confusing to everybody around there. They were outnumbered. They were, uh, uh, they, it, the fact that they did not have lethal weapons on every single one of them also made it so they, they didn't use lethal weapons as often against them. But once that glass was broken and when he's screaming, I, I don't know exactly what he was screaming, but I'm guessing it's along the lines of do not move. I will shoot. Do not move. I will shoot. Yeah. Well, the and thing is, is he was on that video with Ashley Babbitt. You can, you can hear the people who are breaking the glass saying gun, gun, he's got a gun. Like it, it there were like two or three people who said it. And right. so they were very well aware that there was a gun that was pulled on them. And the fact that she jumped through the window is just stupid. Yeah, it's just one shot, but then there's a person who knows how to shoot to kill, and that is what yeah. they know. Is not this is they're not people who are inexperienced. The reason why they weren't hurt that day is because it wasn't a bunch of inexperienced cops. A lot of these people yeah. are capital police officers or veterans who have been uh, serving the military for forever, and then they come onto you know to get w welcomed under the capital police force because it's it's usually an honor. It's a step up uh, in in their minds in the law enforcement community, and it's something that can be really really honorable. I can tell you this. I don't know what kind of intelligence people were getting, but I met with leaders of Black Lives Matter in D.C. I met with other activists in D.C. And we all knew better. And we said, everyone, warn everyone knew. there is no counter protest, nothing. Someone's going to get hurt. Stay away from yeah. it. Don't go to the Capitol. Even when I was driving to the Capitol, I got the, the phone calls and I said, do not come to the Capitol. You need to be in your home. I go to my home. And what we've talked about this before. Uh, and I'm told, oh, we got to search for something because yeah, they look, weren't sure if there's there's a you're a soft target. We got to search for something. I was working for Senator Schumer on 9-11, and that was a horrible day to be working in Congress. Um, I obviously don't work in government anymore. I had a really rough time on January 6th. I thought, you know, that, to me, that was as emotional a day as September 11th was. For me to see our capital being treated like that, to see the peaceful transfer of power being threatened for the first time in our nation's history, it, it was disgusting. Um, and, and, you know, we can't ever let this happen again. And the only way we're not going to let it happen again is if we find the leaders and we hold them accountable. And by the way, we've got to hold some elected officials accountable as well. Absolutely. For edging absolutely. It on. Mm -hmm. All of us um, top the bottom. You know, I mean, You're Josh Hawley, right. Ted Cruz, Moe Brooks, former, the former president of the United States. They need to be, I mean, you know, I don't know you're trying for treason, but they, they are responsible uh, for this and they need to be held accountable. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I leave that to people much smarter than me, yeah. but something needs to be done.
No, I want the moneyed people who who sponsor, who paid for all of this stuff, the people who paid for the buses, the people who funded these organizations, these Oath Keeper groups, these militia groups, funded all of this stuff from top to bottom. But yet we had a Supreme Court decision this week that said uh, the state of California can't know who's giving all this dark money to Americans for prosperity and all this. But yet uh, we we got to know who Ashley Babbitt is. Uh, to me, they're just there's 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 a bunch of messaging missing there. Yeah. Yeah, they look, um, there's, you know, when you're in a criminal case, you're not relying on just the disclosure laws to find out who funded things. So hopefully we're going to find out who funded some of these things, who brought these people there, how they wound up there. There were people moving as a unit there. Who are they? Right. Who are those guys in military fatigue with big weaponry moving as a unit? That's that was some scary. When you see that in a video, that's some scary stuff. If those people would have found my former boss, Chuck Schumer, or Speaker Pelosi, or the vice president, they would have killed him. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's, I mean, this is America. We, we're not supposed to have this here. For, to hear the former guy talking about Banana Republic because, uh, you know, his uh, chief financial officer who stole millions of dollars from the taxpayers of New York State being held accountable and calling that Banana Republic. No, Banana Republic is a president of the United States who lost an election, not conceding the election and welcoming his opponent to the White House, which has been our tradition in this country since we were founded. Uh, That, to me, is Banana Republic stuff. That man should not be allowed within 100 miles of the White House, uh, you know, and and yet he's the likely Republican nominee in 2024. No, you're right. It's sick you talk about the formations. You know, I live not more than a mile away from a free gun range here in central Pennsylvania where you see these these groups. They come together. They practice their shooting. They're, they're working in formation. This stuff is not in the secret. This stuff is out front. And you know, I know a couple people will be happy to tell you they want August to, to happen. They want uh, some kind of, of violence and problems. And they want to reinstall the, the former guy. Well, they, if, they, if they come to Washington... On August 6th, with the intent of doing violence, they will leave in a body bag. Uh, this is not, we're not going to have a January 6th style riot at our Capitol ever again. Uh, and it, it just won't happen. And if it does happen, we've got bigger problems than we're even thinking of right now. Sadly, sadly, you're right. Last question I wanted to get into is the, 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 uh, the January 6th subcommittee. Um, Liz Cheney on the subcommittee, a good move, Scott? Uh <laughs> that's a great way to ask it um good move i think that it it uh, i i would have preferred kinzinger personally um to that but i i also th- th- there's a possibility that mccarthy is not the one that fills out the rest of the slots because he's going to try and act like oh i'm not going to point anybody um so speaker pelosi might have the opportunity to still fill kinzinger you know in regards to liz cheney I think that she has said things that she can't come back from in regards to Republican philosophy and Trumpism and things like that. Um, So I I think that there is a real truth to the matter there. I also think that her dad knows stuff still and is still in the mix on a lot of things. And I think that she's more aware of the situation and the extent of it and how far things actually go up the chain. Uh, I mean, in reality, based on what I've seen, we're talking about the president of the United States directed a terrorist attack on our capital uh, in the, the intent to throw a coup during the counting of the votes to at least stall so that he could have martial law and then extend and stall and then probably just stay in power for an indefinite amount of time. So yeah. we're talking about a, a true a true terrorist attack on our United States. And we cannot allow that to happen ever again. Like and, and I think I think this is the route that we're going to go. I don't based on the people I know, most of the people that are on this committee outside of Liz Cheney, they are not people to mess with. These are not people that like with Aguilar, especially uh, Raskin. Raskin is a person who is, uh, I, I would say, crafty with how we prosecute people. And, and they can take they can take subpoenas. They can bring them. They can put them in prison if they don't show up. This is a different world. This is not a Trump world anymore. And I think the, the sooner that they recognize it, the better off that they would be. But it, it's just not. I think you guys are right. I don't yeah. think yeah. that this is going to happen anytime soon. Chris, 30 seconds. Your thought? 
She's a name brand Republican. It was a good choice because she can act. She could say things and Republicans will hear it as a name brand Republican hearing it. It's career suicide for her. She's lighting her career on fire. The Republican Party is never going back to the party that was her father's party. Um, but she's doing the right thing. I don't agree with Liz Cheney on almost anything policy wise. But she's doing the right thing here. Yeah. And I appreciate yeah. it. And I think it was the right move by the speaker. Sarah, last thought. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Kinzinger, too. The more Republicans you have on this, particularly the ones that are on our side and that are rational, uh, the more America. legitimacy, the more, yeah, the, the more legitimacy that the committee is going to have and Republicans can't attack it then. Yeah, good stuff, guys. So, thanks so much, Scott, Sarah, Chris. Thanks so much for your time, your thoughts. Uh, great stuff. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Rick. I uh, appreciate our all-star panel on uh, the thoughts that came out of that. Uh, if you've got any thoughts, questions, comments, I'd love to hear it. You can email me, Rick, at therigsmithshow.com. Any future topics you want to hear the panel uh, weigh in on, uh, email us. Uh, if you missed any of today's program, therigsmithshow.com. That's where you go to get the podcast. The Rick Smith Show app on the smartphone. Take the program on the go, wherever you go. And as always, you can email me, Rick, at therigsmithshow.com. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at Show.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.